we're in Genesis 37, uh, if you want to turn there after a break of a couple of weeks here, we kind of begin the last section of the book, the life of Joseph. Um, there's a little uh, chapter 38 that kind of jumps back to one more episode with one of Jacob's other sons, uh, Judah, uh, and then from 39 on to 50, uh, just con the continuing story uh, of the, uh, the narrative of the life of, of Joseph. Uh, several reasons that, uh, that studying or Joseph's life is important to us and why we're thankful that God gave us the story of Joseph. Uh, and the first one is the fact that it helps us tie in the growth of the nation of Israel. It gets them to Egypt and they go from simply being the tribe of Jacob to actually a nation itself. God has to orchestrate events to get Joseph into Egypt, to get him in a pl place of power where he can then bring the rest of his family there so they can live in an area called Goshen where they'll be protected and are able to, uh, to grow into uh, a, a nation. Now, this was all prophesied and given to Abraham back in Genesis 15. There God says to Abraham, uh, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they will come out with great possessions. So the story of, uh, of the Exodus is all predicted, of course, uh, and told by God in advance to Abraham. And Joseph sets the stage for that. Secondly, Joseph's actions, as we'll see as we go through his life, we'll kind of point out many times how they foreshadowed the life of, uh, of Christ. We would say he's a foreshadowing or a type of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to see here today uh, in our story in chapter 37 that he is rejected by his brethren. And in his rejection, then he's placed uh, in, a, in an area where he can become their savior or their redeemer in terms of saving the nation of, uh, of Israel in the same way that Christ was rejected by his brethren. Uh, and in that rejection led to the cross and to uh, becoming the savior uh, of all mankind. And there's lots of other uh, issues like that as we look at the life of Joseph. Uh, and third, Joseph's just a great example of a, of a young guy that is pulled out of his home and out of his culture and out of his friends and thrown into a very worldly, a very secular, a very pagan culture. And yet he's able to remain with his faith intact and is able to prosper no matter what kind of adversity he comes up against. And God is able to use his life tremendously like he does another young man named Daniel. Both of them would interpret dreams of kings. Both of them would not compromise their faith. Both were jailed for their obedience to the Lord, and both eventually were made vice regents or like prime ministers of the nation where God had taken them. Uh, fourthly, <clears throat> maybe above everything else, it's a picture of, of God sovereignly orchestrating events to get his will done. In this case the saving of the nation of, uh, uh, of Israel. And uh, therefore, it's just, uh, it, it's just such a great story that can help a lot of people if you have been through real, real tragedy and real difficulty in your life, whether it was recently or when you were, when you were younger. And uh, we can see that, that Joseph's life, the things that he's going through as a young guy growing up, not the best situation, it's gonna get worse then it's going to get worse, <laughs> then it's going to get worse, and finally uh, God will uh, raise, raise him up. But it's quite, it's quite the journey. Uh, later, in Genesis 45, verse 7, uh, he would say to the brothers who are about ready to, in our story, sell him into slavery, he says, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. It's a pretty heavy-duty statement, given what we're about ready to study and read, what he goes through. Yeah, you guys beat me to death. Yeah, you guys threw me in a pit. Yeah, you were about ready to kill me, but Judah intervened and suggests that I get sold into slavery. And yes, I was treated like a slave. I was sold in the slave markets of Egypt. I was falsely accused. I spent years in prison. I go all of this, and the end says, but you guys didn't really do it. 
It was all God all along, and he had his reasons for, uh, for doing it. So it becomes uh, quite a story and quite an example for us that might help us in, uh, in many ways. Two things are, are going on in Joseph's life. One is the, the ongoing favoritism, which we've already seen of Jacob towards him because he is the son of Rachel, uh, the wife that he, that he loved. Uh, and secondly, God will now give him these visions or these dreams, as we'll say, that uh, they will add fuel to the fire in terms of the jealousy and the envy that leads to hatred, all necessary to get Jacob, uh, uh, Jacob's sons to uh, sell their brother into slavery. Well, let's look at the first four verses. Joseph's family situation uh, has been bad, but now it is deteriorating, we would say. Verse 1, now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So two factors in the deterioration. What is this idea of the bad report? So he's out uh, in the fields with the sheep, with Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and, uh, and Asher. Uh, and these guys, of course, are, are at the bottom of the food chain uh, of these brothers because they're the sons of the concubines. Then you have the sons of Leah. Then you have the sons of Rachel. And, uh, uh, and we've already noted in Jacob's behavior and, and so forth, uh, they're, they're well aware uh, of that uh, fact that uh, in the pecking order of things, they're on the bottom, these four guys. And this is who Joseph is out in the field with. Uh, and apparently, they do something in their behavior, whatever it is, maybe they're just slackers, maybe they're lazy, uh, we don't really know. But they do something that causes uh, Joseph, uh, he feels necessary to bring this, quote, bad report uh, back to his father. Now, if Reuben was there, He's kind of the Luna. He's like the, you know, the number one son. Uh, he could have gone to him with it, but apparently he's not around. So in a sense, <laughs> he does the right thing to report it to his, his father. Uh, but interesting, verse 2, when it says he brought a bad report, the report, uh, word report in Hebrew is diba. It's always used in the rest of Scripture in a negative sense, almost always in an untrue report. Uh, it's got uh, the adjective with it, uh, translated here bad. Some translations would say evil. Hebrew is ra'ah and is usually evil. So Joseph goes back, whatever the brothers were doing, <laughs> and, and uh, he's no favorite of them to start with, and he fails uh, out of necessity for some reason to give this bad or evil report to his father about what they were doing. Uh, now, that phrase is also used over in Numbers 13.32. And you remember when, uh, when Moses with the children of Israel come out of Egypt, they kind of finally come to the land of Canaan, the, the land that God promises them. So they send in the 12 spies to spy out the land, to check it out. Two of them come back with a good report, right? Uh, Joshua uh, and Caleb. And they're talking about how beautiful it is. The agriculture is there. There's vineyards, there's olive groves, and there's like, this is great, right? They give what we'd say is a good report. But notice the other 10 in verse 32, it says, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report. That's the same word, or an evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. But all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature, there, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak uh, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and we were in their sight. Now, what they're saying is true. I mean, <laughs> there were giants, <laughs> the sons of Anak, they were there. That's, that's, nobody disputes that. Does the, does the land devour those in it? Probably sometime. God wanted the children of Israel there so they would have to live in complete dependence upon him because if he doesn't bring rain, they don't survive. It could be a tough place to live. But with them obeying God and his blessing, it would be the pleasant land or the beautiful land. 
So what they're saying is true, but the way they're framing it and everything, it sounds bad. That's the idea of Joseph. I mean, what the brothers were doing, whatever, whatever bad was, well, they, they were doing something bad, but apparently the way he kind of frames it as a 17-year-old kid, keep in mind, some of these brothers are like 40 years old. Some of them were old enough to be his grandfather. I mean, there's a real age gap here uh, in the ages if you, uh, if you go back. You know, uh, Rachel is not able to have children for a very long time, and she's finally able to have, uh, have uh, him, and he's now 17 years old. Uh, so the way he expresses this, well, it's just not, uh, the, the brothers aren't real thrilled with him over this. And probably the other brothers aren't real thrilled either. Uh, you know, if you're, you're 45 years old, uh, and you've been doing something for a living for 30, 30 years or so, you got some 17-year-old kid that comes along that's somehow your, your younger stepbrother, and uh, he's going back to dad and telling and expressing things that you're doing wrong, but in a very bad way, you're just not real happy. Uh, and things were already deteriorating uh, beyond that. Now, the other factor that's here is, J is Jacob's favoritism. <clears throat> We've already seen it play out. It's stated again here. And that favoritism becomes worse because he makes him a coat of many colors or a tunic. You know, you know, NIV says, a coat of um, highly uh, uh, ornamented. So it was, uh, it was a beautiful, it was a luxurious coat. Some uh, writers would say it indicated <clears throat> in its physical makeup because of longer sleeves and longer length that uh, Jacob was saying he is the heir apparent. He's going to be the boss. He's going to get the double portion that would have gone to Reuben. Uh, Reuben's not doing real good right now in the whole family thing because he had a relationship with the uh, stepmother. So he's, he's not real high on Jacob's list. You have the other couple sons that are mass murderers at this point. So, you know, you know, you got kind of a wild family, you know, here with, uh, with Jacob. Uh, and somehow, it is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> these, are the, <laughs> these are the forefathers. These are the patriarchs. <clears throat> these are the guys that God picks through whom he would bring a nation to bring the Savior of the world. It's just... Uh, Amazing, the, uh, the grace of God. But in the midst of this, uh, Jacob seems to be in a fog about what's going on with his kids. And, uh, and the idea of now presenting him with this coat certainly uh, didn't help matters. Verse 4, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers, they hated him, could not speak peaceably to him. One uh, translates, translation says they they could not abide his friendly speech or the ideas. Every time he tried to say something nice to them, they would just rebuff him and, uh, and drive him away. Don't show any hands, but sometimes this is what happens in family relations when there's envy and there's strife and there's no forgiveness. Uh, and it builds and it, uh, and it grows. But families, uh, his family here was deteriorating. And then the second thing that happens is God comes along and adds, we would say, fuel to the fire by giving Joseph two dreams. Now, whether God intended Joseph to share these dreams or not, certainly he gave him the dreams for a reason, because God knows he's going to be sold into slavery. God knows he's going to get brutalized. God knows he's going to end up in a servant in the house of Potiphar's house. God knows he's going to be falsely accused. God knows He's going to spend years in prison. So he gives them two dreams to say, Joseph, one day you'll see your family again. One day you'll see your father again. I promise. And one day they will all bow down to you. Hold on to that. And obviously Joseph is able to do that. So it becomes this wonderful example of just holding on to the promises of God, no matter what's going on around us circumstantially. Well, let's look at those uh, those dreams that fueled his brother's hatred. Verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. <clears throat> there, uh, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around, bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, 
look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars <laughs> bowed down to me. So he told it uh, to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So the first thing about the revelation of the first dream, we might call it a harvest dream. He's going to rule over his brothers, and, and certainly uh, they get the story. You know, that, uh, you know, they're all equal in terms of uh, sheaves of grain or whatever, and, and his stands upright, the others bow down, uh, and they hate him all the more. Notice the, uh, the response. Uh, and were there, uh, Joseph couldn't figure this out, why he told it. The only thing I can figure is that this dream was so apparent to him that it was from God that he, he just... <laughs> He couldn't help himself. He just had to tell somebody, and, uh, uh, and he just told it to him. Uh, but notice, uh, they hated him, and it's the third time that it's, uh, that phrase is repeated, and it all comes again from these words that we see, jealousy and envy. Jealousy is uh, thinking that someone else should not get or deserve what they're getting. They didn't believe that he should be favored. They didn't believe he should get that robe. They didn't believe that he deserved any of, any of these things. That's a, it's a little bit of an issue for, <laughs> for us sometimes, maybe in the workplace or whatever, you just think, <laughs> you're pretty sure that guy or that gal doesn't deserve that promotion. Whether it should have been you or your buddy or somebody else, you're pretty sure, that happens sometimes, doesn't it? Just a little once, once in a while, somebody gets promoted, doesn't deserve it, and so you're you can be naturally jealous of what has taken place. The brothers have that, but they're also envious. Envious means you want what another person has, and you want them to not have it any longer. It's not like, well, that's a really nice car. I'd like to have one of those. It's like, that's a really nice car, and I want that one. I want it, and so you can't have it. That's, that's envy. Uh, and the brothers are feeling both of these things. Now, Paul says in Galatians 5 that these things, along with murder and lying and a bunch of other stuff, are considered works of the flesh. He says they're part of our sin nature. They're in all of us. And, uh, and we need to be careful because we can allow these things to persist in our lives. And if they begin to, they lead to ha hatred. And hatred very often will get acted <coughs> upon. And that's what we see here. The second dream involved the entire family. We might call that his celestial dream with the sun and the moon and the stars involved. Uh, and two things are going on. Not only is it saying that his father would actually bow down to him, which happens, of course, right? That all, all happens later. Uh, not only does that happen, the idea that putting two dreams together means it's a surety. It's going to happen. And he would express this later in Genesis 41, verse 32, to the Pharaoh. Uh, there, this is, uh, again, Joseph in Egypt. And the dream was reported to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Joseph has had two dreams and God is saying, this is definitely going to happen. And that's why I repeated it uh, twice. The result of the second dream revealed, again, we've already seen their jealousy and now their, their envy. No, it's interesting that, uh, again, the brothers hated him for it. Jacob rebuked him, but he kind of contemplated the thing. I mean, he's probably realizing, and Jacob doing the best he can to walk with the Lord, trust God, and we've, we've seen him certainly stumble, but he's, he's in Hebron, he's, he's in the place God wants him, he's trying to walk with the Lord and, uh, and everything, and he's got to be impressed in the idea that that he knows his son. He's a pretty good kid. And, uh, and for him to be saying these things, which would potentially endanger his own life, uh, but certainly expressing them with the idea that these aren't just dreams because I had a bad dinner last night. He'd gone down to Zippy's and had a little too much chili or anything. It wasn't that. It was that God had actually spoken to him through a dream. Jacob seems to recognize it. He doesn't like it. He doesn't understand it. He rebukes him for maybe expressing it, but he's still pondering the whole thing uh, in his own mind. So Joseph 
bad report puts him at odds with his brothers. Jacob's favoritism is not helping. And now uh, God adds, in a sense, fuel to the fire by giving Joseph these two dreams. So his brother hates him all the more. Well, let's look at the third thing, uh, where the brothers will actually determine uh, at first, of course, to kill him. They end up selling him into slavery, verse 12 to 28. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said, No way. No, he, he says, here I, here I am. Uh, we'll talk about some of the reasons he might want to say it. No way. Uh, verse 14, Then he said to him, Please go and see if it is uh, well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent them out to the valley of, uh, out of the valley of Hebron. That's where they are. To, uh, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was, wandering in the field. <laughs> the man asked him, saying, <clears throat> What are you seeking? So he said, uh, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found him in Dothan. Now when they uh, saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Uh, then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. I think the dreams affected them a little bit. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what becomes of his dreams. Who gave him the dreams? God did. Is that affecting the brother's hatred towards him? Yes, it actually is. Is God orchestrating their hatred towards him to get him thrown into the pit? Yes, he is. Does God allow and orchestrate bad people to do bad things to you sometimes for his purposes and his will? Apparently he does. And, and Joseph is able to comprehend that at least at some point in time in his life. Verse 21, but Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into the pit which is in the wilderness and do not lay a hand on him that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then the Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. So here, again, uh, Jacob is determined to send Joseph off to find his brothers. And there's more than a couple of reasons for, uh, for concern. It's 50 miles. I mean, they're in Hebron. Uh, and, uh, and to get to Shechem, it's, uh, it's 50 miles away. Uh, the other uh, issue here, uh, again, is the idea that uh, there was this little incident that took place in Shechem where <laughs> the brothers killed everybody there whose bones are now rotting in the homes in which they built and lived. Um, and uh, there could have been reason why Jacob was a little concerned, hearing that the flock and the brothers are in this area. Uh, also a concern should be in sending Joseph up there, a 17-year-old kid by, him, by himself. And then the fact that, again, that the brothers hated him, could not speak peacefully to him. It's just kind of hard to believe or understand how Jacob is not, not tracking with this. Uh, and he may have been very concerned uh, about sending Joseph off, but he does it anyway. And again, the third factor is you have now a very well-dressed Hebrew youth wandering alone in the area of Shechem, where his big brothers killed everybody that was uh, there. But God is watching over Joseph. Joseph is, is not alone. And even when he arrives and gets there, uh, he could have turned around and come back. But just so happens, somebody comes along and says, I know where they are. They're right up here in Dotham. And, uh, and he continues on his way. Another 14 miles farther, making Joseph's trip from home 64 miles so far. 
uh, way beyond the umbrella of his father's protection. Knowing all of this and the concern, Jacob sends him anyway. Notice verse 13 again, come, I will send you to them. Uh, and it's a pretty incredible statement. His only reply is, here I am. Just like, no, no hesitation, not, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's 50 miles. Uh, he, and uh, by the way, they all hate my guts. Uh, do you really want, you know, uh, he, you know, there's a lot of things he could have come back with to his father, but he, hey, uh, just let me know. I'm ready to go. Here I am. Uh, now notice also that some of the brothers are determined to kill Joseph. Not all, uh, but some. Verse 18. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near, they conspired against him to kill him. So they're already planning out. They said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. And then there's another line about what will become of his dreams now. This idea, these dreams that were from God, that were like so, uh, so heavy upon Joseph's heart, for whatever reason, he felt compelled to share them, believing they were from God. His father's like, hey, you probably should have said that, but uh, hmm, interesting. I'm thinking that over. But the brothers, it inspires them to now kill him. Of course, that's not going to happen. God needs Joseph alive. But it's because this dreamer is coming. Again, it's not all. Notice Reuben is determined to intervene on Joseph's behalf. Reuben, it's on his watch. Again, he's the big brother. He's the one that's responsible. He's the one that's in charge. He's the one that's going to have to give an explanation if something happens to, uh, to Joseph. Um, and uh, we don't know a lot about his character yet, but he jumps in at this point. Uh, and his, uh, his words are very, uh, very uh, forceful. Verse 21, when he says, let us not take his life, that's not a suggestion. Uh, this is a big brother uh, very forcibly giving a com command. Let us not kill him. Uh, he says in verse 22, shed no blood. Uh, again, these aren't uh, words of, of suggestion. He's intervening. And of course, he's going to throw him into the pit, it says. And then when this thing kind of cools down, he's going to come back, pull Joseph out uh, and, uh, and get him uh, back home. <clears throat> but it's nine of the brothers that determined to actually kill him. Verse 23, uh, when they had come, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on it. They took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water. No water is a very important statement. It means he'll die uh, right there. Uh, with some water in the pit, he could have lasted uh, a lot longer and extended the, uh, the chance that somebody might find him, uh, but he's only got days uh, in this pit. Uh, one writer said uh, of this whole incident, they were like a pack of dogs. His nine brothers were upon him, scratching and pulling the hated coat from him and likely his remaining clothing, finally dumping him like a dead body into a pit so deep and vertical that he could not climb out. And uh, what do they do after they have brutally attacked their younger brother? They sit down and have a little meal probably with the supplies that, uh, that he has brought, uh, uh, brought to them. Uh, and again, their remorse, their, their uh, thoughts on this uh, years later are recorded in chapter 42, verse 21, where they say of themselves, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. So keep in mind, when they throw Joseph's in there, Joseph's not hitting the, hitting the deck down. They're going, no problem. God's with me. I got this on the way to Egypt. I get it. You know, God's work. All things work together for good. Don't worry, brother. No, he's begging for his life. He's screaming their names. I mean, Joseph is going to process this and, and come to these conclusions and hang on to the promises of God. But he's, this is not like a, some kind of a supernatural you know, spiritual geek at the bottom of this thing you know, that he's able to just grab and grasp, you know, the reality of God's sovereignty. He's, he's freaking out uh, and he's screaming for his life uh, and um, screaming their names out probably. And those names uh, probably echoed in their ears for, for a very long time. Uh, notice that it's Judah that jumps in. He's determined to sell Joseph and we don't really know his motivation, but it appears that he's saying, hey, he's our own flesh and blood. 
I mean, you know, let's, let's sell them. And he kind of appeals to the other guys. Well, he can get a little money for them. But uh, I think it's fairly obvious that he's doing the best he can to try to save Joseph's life. It won't be much of a life being sold into slavery, but he won't, uh, won't be dead uh, either. Uh, and, of course, there's the mention of the Ishmaelites and the Midianites who had uh, intermarried uh, from the same part of the Arabah. And so they were traveling together on their way to Egypt at that time was the uh, center of the international slave trade uh, in the world, much like Thailand would be today or some other places because uh, the idea of slave trading uh, is huge uh, in, in the world today. Uh, this is the problem that has not gone away. It's actually gotten much worse. And, uh, and of course, through the slave, sex slave trade industry that exists in our own country, it's still a very, very prevalent thing that uh, we don't hear much, much about. But a horrific thing for Joseph, who would have been probably stripped of his clothing at that point, tied to an animal with something on his back to carry, and then to go through the process of a slave trade market uh, there in Egypt would have not been a, uh, an easy thing uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, Joseph's family situation kept deteriorating, and that's because of envy and because of jealousy that led to a hatred uh, the dreams that God gives actually add fuel to the fire. And the brothers were determined uh, to kill him, but end up selling him into slavery. Now, uh, verse 29 then, Joseph's future, they have to hide it or not disclose it to the father. Verse 29, uh, then Reuben returned to the pit, uh, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, the lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? Uh, so they took Joseph's tu tunic, killed a kid of the goat, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you, uh, do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put, on, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. So uh, Reuben returns, and uh, Joseph is not there again. He's probably <laughs> out being responsible, taking a, uh, keeping uh, care of the sheep. He returns uh, at some point in time. Uh, to get Joseph, and he's not there. Notice he kind of goes into the morning at this point, tearing his own clothes. Uh, and very interesting, the, the robe uh, playing such a significant role in this whole story. Uh, the robe was a gift of love. It was torn up in hate, and now it becomes a tool for deception uh, to uh, deceive their, their father. Now, there's a bit of uh, irony in all of this because you remember it was Jacob who had also deceived his father at one point in time by putting on, on a robe, in that case that was not his, and by killing uh, a goat uh, and using its meat for the meal and using its, its basically skin to cover his, uh, his own bare arms. Uh, and now the deception has come back to him full circle. Uh, the brothers again report Joseph's death. Notice the full force uh, of the statements. He says, first, uh, my, it's my son's robe. Second, uh, a fierce animal has devoured him. And third, Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. So he refuses to be comforted. Now, the, the brothers probably cooked this whole deal up, of course, thinking they're doing their dad a favor. I mean, they could have just showed up and, hey, how's it going? Well, where's Joseph? I don't know. I haven't seen him. You know, and then they would have been, well, search the countryside. Well, we could never find him. You know, we never find him, and we never find him. And they're thinking how horrible that would be for their father. After all, he loves him so much. It's his favorite son. The least we can do is, is deliver some evidence that he's dead so he can grieve, he can mourn, and he can just get it over with. That's not exactly what happens. Uh, yeah, he grieves and he mourns, and he says, and I will mourn every day the rest of my life, and I will go to the grave mourning doesn't really work out the way they thought it was going to. The last verse, verse 36 in the chapter, very important. Joseph's been delivered. 
and it's to Potiphar, and I would say right on schedule. Verse 36, now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. So we're introduced to Potiphar, who we're going to get to know more in these uh, other chapters. Uh, we have his official position as captain of the guard, and, uh, and we see God orchestrating these events to place what we might say is Israel's human savior in a place where he could actually save them and deliver them uh, in a time of famine and then uh, get them to a place where they can grow uh, as a nation. But uh, uh, Joseph, of course, uh, becomes uh, very bitter and he establishes the, uh, uh, the JVS, that's the uh, Joseph Victimhood Society. Uh, he finds an attorney to try to make the best he can, brings lawsuits against uh, Jacob and the brothers that's what people do today, right? And uh, you can understand it. I mean, it's like terrible things happen to people. Uh, they do see themselves as being victimized because they have been. Uh, but for the believer in Jesus Christ, uh, even those horrible incidents should take on a different light if we understand the story of Joseph. God gives us the story of Job so we can understand suffering from a different perspective. We'd really be lost without the story of Job. God gives us a vision into the heavenlies and what's going on so we can see what's happening, how God is allowing certain things in the life of Job so we can understand what's going on in our lives. Unbelievers, when horrible things to happen to them, it's just a bummer. That's just it. It's just a bummer. When horrible things happen to Christians, they have to reflect that God allowed this. If he allowed it, he must... I'm not real happy about it, but he allowed, must have hap, allowed it for a reason. What is the reason? And it's okay to ask that question and search out that question. Of course, we're okay with Joseph being sold into slavery because we know the whole story. It's like, don't worry, Joseph. This is, it turns out really good. You get to marry some beautiful gal, and you have a couple of kids, and you got a lot of money. Uh, you get to drive this cool BMW chariot all over the place and call the shots. This is really going to work out, Joseph. Just hang in there. See, we're, we're okay because we know the rest of the story. Joseph's like screaming bloody murder for his life, uh, but he does process this through and begin to understand, we'll see that uh, God's, God's doing something. Uh, God's allowed it uh, for, for a reason. And, uh, and again, he doesn't uh, fall into demeaning remarks. He's, uh, you know, we don't see the... Some of the things that we would expect. Uh, and so the question is, how does Joseph get through this without becoming bitter? And I do think it's a process. He, he's not in that pit going, hey, it's okay, no problem, trust in the Lord here, hallelujah. I don't think he's doing that. I think he's uh, freaking out. And he probably was for a while. But at some point in time, he comes to believe what his great-grandfather Abraham believed, and that is you can trust the word of God and believe the word of God. And he has the promises handed down to him, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And he's heard them firsthand. All of those stories, everything we've studied up to this point, Joseph knows all of those stories. He knows them very well from his father, from his grandfather. And he's going to determine to trust God and believe God's promises. They're going to become a prosperous nation. God is going to give them the land of Canaan. Their descendants will be there one day and enjoy that land. He doesn't understand where he's at now, what's going on, but he knows what God said and he's going to trust it. He knows that he'll see his brothers one day. He knows that he'll see his father again one day. The big issue is what is his attitude going to be in the meantime and how is he going to deal with and prevent himself from becoming like his brothers? Full of envy, full of jealousy, and full of hatred. Uh, and he determines to trust God and hang on to the promises of God. Uh, and that's why it's just such a great story. Because uh, uh, there's people that, that need, need to hear this story and know it. Because there's such abuse that goes on uh, with people today uh, in a lot of different circumstances or situations that are, that are similar in many ways to this. And uh, I think the story of, of Joseph and his life can can help us because we'll we'll just track right right along with him you know through through the process it's just uh, as the title of the message this is the beginning of the journey now for joseph it's going to get worse 
That's okay, it'll get worse. Well, that's okay, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. <laughs> I don't know if you can relate <laughs> to, uh, to Joseph or not, but uh, uh, maybe to some degree you can, and this will help us trust, trust the Lord when, uh, when things are uh, uh, not going so great. James says in James uh, 1, 2, consider it pure, pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces or develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. I think we all want to be mature, complete, not lacking anything. We all want to be able to persevere. We just don't like that other part. <laughs> it comes up there about uh, pure joy, facing trials. That's, that's the difficult part. Well, let's pray. Lord, but we thank you. You've given us uh, great examples like Daniel, like Joseph, like Job, that we can understand your sovereignty and, and, uh, and certainly you've given us the cross of Jesus Christ that we might understand not just your sovereignty, but your great love for us and your great compassion for us. Lord, so we pray that uh, through our study of Joseph, we could just grow to trust you, Lord, more and more, even when we're facing those, those difficult trials, those varied trials, help us to face them with pure joy, knowing the outcome, that you're working something for good in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.